The holidays are a time for relaxation and spending time with your loved ones. But for someone like Sherlock Holmes, even the simplest of days can hold a mystery. The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Read by Carl Wallace I had called upon my friend Sherlock Holmes upon the second morning after Christmas with the intention of wishing him the compliments of the season. He was lounging upon the sofa in a purple dressing gown, a pipe rack within his reach upon the right, and a pile of crumpled morning papers, evidently newly studied, near at hand. Besides the couch was a wooden chair, and on an angle of the back hung a very seedy and disreputable hard felt hat, much the worse for wear and cracked in several places. A lens and forcep lying upon the seat of the chair suggested that the hat had been suspended in this matter for the purpose of examination. You were engaged, said I. Perhaps I interrupt you. Not at all. I'm glad to have a friend with whom I can discuss my results. The matter is a perfectly tri trivial one. He jerked his thumb in the direction of the old hat. But there are points in connection to it which are not entirely devoid of interest or even of instruction. I seated myself in his armchair and warmed my hands before his crackling fire, for a sharp frost had set in and the windows were thick with the ice crystals. I suppose, I remarked, that homely as it looks, this thing has some deadly story linked onto it? This is the clue which will guide you in the solution of some mystery and the punishment of some crime? No, no, no crime, said Sherlock Holmes, laughing. Only one of those whimsical incidents would happen when you have four million human beings all jostling each other within the space of a few square miles. Amid the action or reaction of so swarm of humanity, every possible combination may be expected to take place. And many a little problem would be presented which may be striking bizarre without being criminal. We have already had experience of such. So much so, I remarked, that of the last six cases where I have added to my notes, three have been entirely free of any legal crime. Precisely. You allude to my attempt to recover the Armini Adler papers, the singular case of Miss Murray Sutherland, and the adventure of the man with the twisted lip. Well, I have no doubt this small matter will fall into the same innocent category. You know, Peterson, the... Uh, Commissioner, yes, it is to him that this trophy belongs. It is his hat? No, no, he found it. Its owner is unknown. I think you will look upon it not as a battered belly clock, but as an intellectual problem. It first is asked how it came here. It arrived upon Christmas morning, in the company with a good fat goose, which I have no doubt, resting at this moment in front of Peterson's fire. The facts of these. At about four o'clock on Christmas morning, Peterson, who as you know is a very honest fellow, was returning from some small um, jollification and was making his way homeward down Tottenham Court Road. In front of him he saw, in the gaslight, a tallish man, walking with a slight swagger, carrying a white goose slung over his shoulder. As he reached the corner of Goode Street, a row broke out between the stranger and a little knot of roughs. One of the latter knocked off the man's hat, upon which he raised his stick to defend himself, and swinging it over his head, smashed the shop window behind him. Peterson had rushed forward to protect the stranger from his assailants, but the man, shocked at having broken the paper, and seeing an official-looking person in uniform rushing toward him, dropped his goose, took to his heels, and vanished amidst the labyrinth of small streets with lie at the back of Tottenham Court Road. The rust had also foiled the appearance of Peterson, as he was left in possession of the field of battle, and also of the spoils of victory, the shape of this battered hat and a most unimpeachable Christmas goose. Which surely he restored to their owner. My dear fellow, there lies the problem. It is true that, for Mrs. Henry Baker was printed upon a small card which was tied to the bird's left leg, also show the initials HB are legible upon the lining of the hat, but as there are some thousands of bakers, and some hundreds of uh, Henry Bakers in the city of ours, it is not easy to restore what property to any one of them. What then did Peterson do? He brought round both hat and goose to me on Christmas morning, knowing even the smallest problems are of interest to me. The goose retained her till this morning, when there were signs that, in spite of the slight frost, it would be well that it would be eaten without unnecessary delay. Its finder has carried it off. To fulfill the ultimate destiny of a goose, why well, continue to retain the hat of the unknown gentleman who lost his Christmas dinner? Did you not advertise? No. Then what clue could you have as to his identity? Only as much as we can deduce? From his hat? Precisely. But you were joking. What can you gather from this old battered felt? Here is my lens. You know my methods? 
What did you gather t yourself as the individual of the man who was worn this article? I took the tattered object in my hands and turned it over r rather ruefully. It was a very ordinary black head of the usual round shape, hard and much the worse for wear. The lining had been of red silk, but was a good deal discolored. There was no maker's name, but as Holmes had remarked, the initials HB were sprawled upon one side. It was pierced in a brim for a hat secure, but the elastic was missing. For the rest, it was cracked, seemingly dusty, and spotted in several places. Though there seemed to have been some attempt to hide the discovered patches by smearing them with ink. I can see nothing, said I, handing it back to my friend. On the contrary, Watson, you can see everything. You fail, however, to reason from what you see. You are too timid in drawing your inferences. Then pray tell me, what is it that you can infer from this hat? He picked it up and gazed at it in the peculiar introspective fashion which was his characteristic. It perhaps less suggested than it might have been, he remarked. Yet there are a few interesting inferences of which are very distinct. The view ours would represent at least a strong balance of probability. That the man was highly intellectual is, of course, obvious upon the face of it. And also that he was fairly well to do within the last three years, and though he has now fallen upon evil days. He, has, he had foresight, but is less now than formerly, pointing to a mortal uh, uh, retrogression, which, when taken on the decline of his fortunes, seemed to indicate some evil influence, probably drink, at work upon him. This may account also for the obvious fact that his wife has ceased to love him. My dear Holmes! He has, however, retained some degree of self-respect. He continued, disregarding my uh, remonstrance. He's a man who leads a sedentary life, goes out little, is out of training entirely, is middle aged, has grizzled hair which he's cut within the last few days, which he anoints with lime cream. These are the more pertinent facts which can be d deduced from this hat. Also, by the way, it is extremely improbable that he has had gasoline on in this house. You were certainly joking, Holmes. Not the least. It's possible that even now, while I give you these results, you are unable to see how they are attained? I have no doubt I am very stupid, but I must confess I am unable to follow you. For example, how did you deduce the man was intellectual? For answer, Holmes clapped a hat upon his head, came right over the forehead, and settled upon the bridge of his nose. Is a question of cubic capacity, said he. A man with so large a brain must have something in it. The decline of his fortunes, then? This hat is three years old. These flat rims curled the edge came in then. It is a hat of the very best quality. Look at the band of ribbed silk and the excellent lining. This man could afford to buy so expensive a hat three years ago and has had no hat since. He has assuredly gone down in the world. Well, that is clear enough, certainly. But how about the foresight and the moral retrogression? Sherlock Holmes laughed. Here's the foresight, said he, putting his finger upon a little disc and loop of the hat secure. They are never sold upon hats. This man ordered one. It's a sign of a certain amount of foresight, since he went out of his way to take this precaution against the wind. But we see now that he has broken the elastic. There's not trouble to replace it. It is obvious he has less foresight than formerly, which is distinct proof of a weakening nature. On the other hand, he has endeavored to conceal some of these stains upon the felt by dumbing with ink which is a sign he has surely not entirely lost his self-respect. Your reasoning is certainly plausible. There are further points. He's middle-aged, his hair is grizzled, but recently cut and uses lime cream, all to be gathered from a close examination of the lower part of the, of the lining. The lens discloses a large number of hair ends, clean-cut by the scissors of the barber. They all appear to be adhesive, and they're a distinct odor of lime cream. This dust, you'll observe, is not the gritty gray dust of the street, but the fluffy brown dust of the house, showing he has been hung up indoors most of the time, while the marks of moisture upon the inside are proof positive that the wearer perspired very freely, and could therefore hardly be in the best of training. But his wife, you said she had ceased to love him. This hat has not been brushed for weeks. When I see you, my dear Watson, with a week's accumulation of dust upon your hat, and when your wife allows you to go out in such a state, I shall fear you have also been unfortunate enough to lose your wife's um, affection. But he might be a bachelor. Nay, he was bringing home the goose as a peace offering to his wife. Remember the card upon the bird's leg. You have an answer to everything. How on earth do you deduce that the gas is not laid on in his house? One tallow stain, or even two, might come by chance. But I see now less than five. I think it would be a little doubt that the individual must be brought in frequent contact with burning tallow. 
walks upstairs at night, probably with his hat in one hand and a guttering candle in the other. Anyhow, he never got tallow stains from a gas jet. Are you satisfied? Well, it is very ingenious, said I, laughing. But since you said just now, there has been no crime committed, and no harm done save the loss of a goose, all this seems to be rather a waste of energy. Sherlock Holmes had opened his mouth to reply when the door flew open, and Peterson, the commissioner, rushed to the apartment with flushed cheeks and the face of a man who, who is dazed with astonishment. The goose, Mr. Holmes, the goose, sir, he gasped. Eh? Whatever then? Has it returned to life and flapped off through the kitchen window? Holmes twisted himself round upon the sofa to get a fairer view of the man's excited face. See, see here, sir. See what my wife found in its crop. Held out his hand displayed upon the center of the palm a brightly scintillating blue stone, rather smaller than a bean in size, but of such purity and radiance it twinkled on an electric point in the dark hollow of his hand. Sherlock Holmes set up with a whistle. By Jove, Peter, says he, this is a treasure trove indeed. I suppose you know what you have got? A diamond, sir? A precious stone. Cuts in the glass as though it, it, it were putty. It's more than a precious stone. It is THE precious stone. Not the Countess of Markar's well, blue carbuncle. Precisely so. I don't know its size and shape, seeing that I have read the advertisement about it in the Times every day lately. It's absolutely unique. This value can only be conjectured. But the reward offered of one thousand pounds is certainly not within the twentieth part of the market price. A thousand pounds! Great Lord of mercy! The Commissioner plumped down into a chair and stared from one uh, to the other of us. That's the reward. The reason though there are sentimental considerations in the background, which would induce the Countess to part with half her fortune if she could but uh, recover the gem. It was lost, if I remember right, at the Hotel Cosmopolitan, I remarked. Precisely so. On December 22nd, just five days ago, John Horner, a plumber, was accused of having extracted it from the lady's jewel case. The evidence against him was so strong that the case has been referred to the Assizes. Has some account of the matter here, I believe. He murmured among his newspapers, glancing over the dates, till at last he smoothed one out, doubled it over, and read the following paragraph. Hotel Cosmopolitan Drew Robbery, John Horner, 26, Plumber, was brought up upon the charge of having, upon the, the 22nd, abstracted from the jewel case of the Countess of Morocar, the valuable gem known as the Blue Carbuncle. James Ryder, upper tenor of the hotel, gives evidence to the effect that he had showed Horner up to the dressing room of the Countess upon the day of the robbery, in order that he might sol solder the second bar of the grate, which was loose. He remained with Horner some little time, but it finally had been called away. But upon returning, he found that Horner disappeared, the bureau had been forced open, and the small Morocco casket, in which, it, as it afterwards transpired, the Countess was accompanied to keep her jewel, was lying empty upon the dressing table. Ryder instantly gave the alarm, and Horner was arrested the same evening, but the lost stone could not be found either upon his person or in his rooms. When Catherine Cusack, maid to the Countess, deposed to have heard Ryder's cry of dismay upon discovering the robbery, to rushed into the room where she found matters as described by the last witness. Inspector Bradstreet, B Division, gave evidence as to the arrest of Horner, who struggled frantically and protested his innocence in the strongest terms. Evidence of previous conviction for robbery had not been given against the prisoner. The magistrate refused to deal summarily with the offence, but referred it to the assizers. Horner, who had shown signs of intense emotion during the proceedings, faded away the conclusion and was carried out of court. Hmm. So much for the police court, said Holmes thoughtfully, tossing aside the paper. The question for us now is to solve the sequence of events leading for a rifled jewel case at one end to the crop of a goose in Tottenham Court Road as the other. You see, Watson, our little reductions have suddenly assumed a much more important and less uh, innocent aspect. Here is the stone. The stone came from the goose. And the goose came from Mr. Henry Baker, a gentleman with a bad hat and all the other characteristics with which I bored you. So now we must set ourselves very seriously to find this gentleman and asserting what part he has played in this little mystery. To do that, we must try the simplest means first. These lay undoubtedly in an advertisement in the evening papers. If this fail, I shall have recourse to other methods. What will you say? Give me a pencil and that slip of paper. Now then, found at the corner of Goode Street, a goose in a black felt hat. Mr. Henry Baker can have the same by applying at 6.30 this evening at 221B Baker Street. That is clear and concise. Very. Will we see it? Well, he is sure to keep an eye on the papers, since to a poor man the loss w was a heavy one. He was certainly scared by his mischance in breaking the window, but by the approach of Peterson he saw nothing but flight. 
but since then he must have bitterly regretted the impulse which caused him to drop his bird. Then again, the introduction of his name will cause him to see it, for anyone who knows him will direct his attention to it. Here are Peterson, right down to the inter advertising agency, I have this put in the evening papers. Very well, sir. And this stone? Ah, uh, yes, I shall keep the stone. Thank you. When I say, Peterson, just buy a goose on your way back and leave it here with me. You must have one to give the gentleman the place of the one your family is currently uh, devouring. When the commissioner had gone, Holmes took up the stone and held it against the light. It's a bonny thing, he said. See how it glints and sparkles. Of course, there's a nucleus and focus of crime. Every good stone is. They are the devil's pet baits. And the larger and older jewels, every facet may stand for a bloody deed. This stone is not yet uh, 20 years old. It was found on the banks of the Amoy River in southern China. It's remarkable at having every characteristic of the carbuncle, save it is blue in shed in, instead of ru ruby red. In spite of its use, there's already a sinister history. There have been two murders, a acid throwing, a suicide, and several robberies brought about for the sake of this 40 grain weight of a crystallized charcoal. Who would think that so pretty a toy would be a purveyor to the gallows on the prison? I'll lock it up on my strong box now and draw, drop a line to the countess to say we have it. Do you think this man Horner is innocent? I cannot tell. Well then, do you imagine this other one, Henry Baker, had anything to do with the matter? It is, I think, much more likely that Henry Baker is an absolutely innocent man, who had no idea the bird he was carrying was of considerably more value than if it were made of solid gold. That, however, I shall have determined by a very simple test if we have an answer to our ad advertisement. And you can do nothing until then? Nothing. In that case, I shall continue my professional round. But I shall come back in the evening at the hour you mentioned, for I should like to see the solution of so uh, tangled a, uh, a business. Very glad to see you. I dined at seven. There was a woodcock, I believe. By the way, in view of recent occurrences, perhaps I ought to ask Mrs. Hudson to examine its crop. I had been delayed at a case. It was a little after half past six when I found myself in Baker Street once more. As I approached the house, I saw a tall man in a Scotch bonnet with a coat which was buttoned up to his chin, waiting outside in the bright semicircle which was thrown from the fanlight. Just as I arrived, the door was open, and we were shown together into Holmes' room. Mr. Henry Baker, I believe, said he, rising from his armchair, and greeting the visitor with the easy air of, of geniality which he could so readily assume. Pray take this chair by the fire, Mr. Baker. It's a cold night. I observe your circulation is more adapted for summer th than for winter. Ah, Watson, you've just come at the right time. Is that your hat, Mr. Baker? Yes, sir. It's undoubtedly my hat. There's a large man with rounded soldiers, a massive head, a broad, intelligent face, slipped down to a pointed beard of grizzled brown. A touch of red in nose and cheeks, with a slight tremor in his extended hand, recalled Holmes' surmise as to his habits. His rusty black frock coat was buttoned up right up in front, with a collar turned up, and his lank wrist protected from his sleeves with no sign of cuff or shirt. He spoke in a slow, staccato fashion, choosing his words with care, gave the impression generally of a man of learning, and letters who had had ill usage at the hands of fortune. We have attended these things for some days, said Holmes, because we expect to see an advertisement for you giving your address. A visitor gave a rather shamefaced laugh. Shillings have not been so plentiful with me as they once were, he remarked. I have no doubt the gang of roughs who assaulted me had carried off both my hat on the bird. Did I care to spend more morning in a hopeless attempt at recovering them? Very naturally. By the way, about the bird, we were compelled to eat it. To eat it? Our visitor had half rose from his chair as in excitement. Yes, it would have been of no, no use to anyone had we not done so. But I presume this other bird goose upon the sideboard, which is about the same weight and perfectly fresh, will let you to purpose equally well? Oh, certainly, certainly, asked Mr. Baker with a sigh of relief. Of course, we still have the feather of his legless crop and so of your old bird, if you wish. The man burst into a hearty laugh. It might be useful to me as relics of my inventory, he said. But beyond that, I can hardly see what use of them are going to be to me. No, sir, so I think that with your permission, I will confine my attention to the excellent bird which I perceive upon the sideboard. Sherlock Holmes glanced sharply across at me with a slight shrug of his shoulders. There's your hat, then, and there are your birds, said he. By the way, would it bore you to tell me where you got the other one from? I am someone of a foul fancier, and some seen a better grown goose. Certainly, sir, said Baker, who had risen and tucked his newly grained property under his arm. There are a few of us who frequent the Alpha Inn near the museum. We are to be found in the museum itself during the day, you understand. 
This year our good host, Windygate by name, it's to the Goose Club, by which, on consideration of some few pence every week, we were each to receive a bird at, 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 at Christmas. My pence was duly paid, the rest you are familiar with. I am much dearer to you, sir, for a Scotch bonnet is fitted neither to my years nor no, no, no my gravity. With a comical pomposity of manner, he bowed solemnly to both of us and strode out upon his way. So much for Mr. Henry Baker, said Holmes when he closed the door behind him. It's quite certain he knows nothing whatsoever about the matter. Are you hungry, Watson? Not, not particularly. I suggest we turn our dinner into our supper and follow up the school when it's still hot. By all means. It was a bitter night, so we drew our ulsters and wrapped cravats about our throats. Outside, the stars were shining coldly in a cloudless sky, and the breath of the passers by blew into the smoke like so many pistol shots. Our footfalls rang out crisply and loudly as we swung through the doctor's quarter, Wimpole Street, Harley Street, and so through Wigmore Street into Oxford Street. In a quarter of an hour, we were at Bloomsbury in the Alpha Inn, which was a small public house at the corner of one of the streets which ran down into Holborn. Holmes pushed open the door of the private bar and ordered uh, two glasses of beer from the ruddy-faced, wide-open landlord. Your beer should be excellent if it is as good as your goose, said he. My geese? The man seemed surprised. Yes, I was speaking only half an hour ago to Mr. Henry Baker, who is a, a member of, of your goose club. Ah, yes, I see. You see, sir, them's not our goose, geese. Indeed, is then. Well, I got a two dozen from a salesman in the uh, uh, Covent Garden. Indeed, I know some of them. Which is it? Breckenridge is his name. Ah, I don't know him. Well, here's your good health, landlord, and prosperity of your house. Good night. Now for Mr. Breckenridge, he continued, bumming up his coat as he came out of the fresh the air. Remember, Watson, as though we have so homely a thing as a goose on one end of this chain, you have the other, a man who will certainly get seven years penal servitude unless he can establish his innocence. It's possible that an inquiry may confirm his guilt, but in any case, we have a line of investigation which have been missed by the police, with a single chance is placed in our hands. Let us follow it to the bitter end. Face us to the south down and quick march. We passed across Holbert down Indel Street and so through a zigzag of slums to Covent Garden Market. One of the largest stalls bore the name of Breckenridge upon it, and the proprietor, a horsey looking man with a sharp face and trim uh, side whiskers, was helping a boy to put up the shutters. Good evening. It's a cold night, said Holmes. The salesman nodded and shot a, uh, a questioning glance at my companion. So a lot of geese, I see, continued Holmes, pointing at the bare slabs of marble. But you have fi five hundred tomorrow morning. That's no good. Well, there were some on the stall with a gas flare. Ah, but I was recommended to you. Goodbye. The liner of the Alpha. Ah, yes, I sent him a couple of dozen. Fine birds they were, too. Now, well, where did you get them from? To my surprise, the question provoked a burst of anger from the salesman. Now then, mister, says he, with his head cocked and his arms akimbo, what are you driving at? Let's have a straight now. It is straight enough. Should you like to know who sold you the goose which you supplied to the Alpha? Well, then I shan't tell you. So now. Oh, it's a matter of no importance, but I don't know why you should be warm over it's, it's such a trifle. Warm? He is warm, maybe, if you were pestered as I am. Want to pay good money for a good article, it should be in the business. But it's where the geese, and where to sell the geese to, and what will you take for the geese? I would think the only geese in the world to hear the fuss that's made over them. Well, I have no connection with any other people who are making inquiries, said Holmes carelessly. Won't tell us the bet is off, that's all. But I'm always ready to back my opinion on a matter of fowls, and I have a fiver on it that the bird I ate is, uh, country bred. Well, then you've lost your fiver for its town bread, snapped the salesman. It's nothing of the kind. I say it is. I don't believe it. Do you think you know more about fowls than I, who handled them ever since I was a nipper? I tell you, all those birds that went to the Alpha were town bred. You never persuaded me to believe that. Will you bet then? It's merely taking your money, for I know I'm right. But I have a sovereign on with, on with you, just to teach her not to be obstinate. The salesman chuckled grimly. Read me the books, Bill, said he. A small boy brought around a small, thin volume on a great, great greasy backed one, weighing them out together beneath the hanging lap. Now then, Mr. Cockshire. Said the salesman. Thought it was out of goose, but before I finish, you'll find there's still one left in my shop. See this little book? Yes. That's those people whom I buy. You see? Well, then here on this page are the country folk, and these ask their names and whether our accounts are in the, the, the big ledger. Now then, see this other page in red ink? Well, that's a list of my town suppliers. Now look at the third name. Just read it out to me. Mrs. Oakshot, 117 Brixton Road, 249 Red Holmes. 
Quite so. Let's turn it up on the ledger. Home to the turn of the page indicated. Here you are, Mrs. Oakshot, 117 Brixton Road, Egg and Poultry Supplier. Now then, what's the last entry? December 22nd, 24 geese. Quite so. There you are. And underneath? Sold to Mr. Windigator of the Alpha. What have you to say now? Sherlock Holmes looked uh, deeply chagrined. He drew a sovereign from his pocket and threw it down upon the slab, turning away with the air of a man who disgusts his too uh, deep for words. A few yards off, he stopped under a lamp post and laughed in a hearty, noiseless fashion which was peculiar to him. When you see a man with whiskers of that cut and the pink and protruding out of his pocket, you can always draw him by a bet, he said. Dear sir, if I had put 100, downs, 100 pounds down in front of him, that man would have not given me such a queen information and was drawn from him by the idea he was doing me on a wager. Well, Watson, we are, I fancy, near the end of our quest. The only point for me is to determine is whether we should go on to this Mrs. Oakshot tonight and whether we should reserve it for tomorrow. Careful what that surly fellow said, there are others beside ourselves who are anxious about this matter, and I should. His remarks were suddenly cut short by a loud hubbub which broke up from the stall which we had just left. Turning round, we saw a little rat faced fellow standing in the center of the circle of yellow light, which was thrown by the swinging lamp, while Breckenridge, the salesman framed at the door of his stall, was shaking his fist fiercely at the cringing figure. Had enough of you and your geese, he shouted. Wish you were all the devil together. If you're pestering me anymore with your silly talk, I'll set the dog at you. You bring Mrs. Oakshot here and I'll answer her. What have you got to do with it? Did I buy the geese off you? No, but one that was mine all the same, whined the little man. Well then, a ask Mrs. Oakshot for it. She told me to ask you. Well, you can ask the King of Prussia for all I care. I've had enough of it. Get out of this. He rushed fiercely forward and the inquirer flittered away into the darkness. Ha! It's best save us a visit to Brixton Road, whispered Holmes. Come with me, and we will see what is to be made of this fellow. Striding through the scattered knots of people who lounged around the flaring stalls, my companion sweetly overtook the little man, touched him upon the shoulder. He sprang round, and I could see in the gaslight that every vestige of colour had been driven from his face. Who are you, then? What do you want? he asked in a quavering voice. You will excuse me, said Holmes blandly, but I couldn't help overthrowing the questions which you put to the salesman just now. I think it would be of assistance to you. You? Who are you? How could you know anything of the matter? My name is Sherlock Holmes. My business is to know what other people don't know. How can you know anything of this? Excuse me, I know everything of it. You are endeavoring to trace some geese which are sold by Mrs. Oakshot of Brixton Rose to a salesman in Breckenridge, by him in turn to Mr. Windigate of the Alpha, and by him to his club, of which Mr. Henry Baker is a member. Oh, sir, you're the very man who I've longed to meet, cried the little fellow with outstretched hands and questing fingers. I can hardly explain to you how interested I am in this matter. Sherlock Holmes hailed a four-wheeler which was passing. In that case, we better discuss it in the cozy room rather than this windslept marketplace, said he. But pray, tell me before we go further, who is it that I have the pleasure of assisting? The man hesitated for a moment. My name is John Robertson, he answered with a sidelong glance. No, though the real name, said Holmes sweetly. It's always awkward doing business with an alias. A flush sprang to the white cheeks of the stranger. Well then, said he, my real name is James Ryder. Precisely so. Head attendant at the Hotel Cosmopolitan. Pray step into the cab, and I shall soon be able to do everything which you would wish to know. The little man stood glancing from one to the other with half-frightened, half-hopeful eyes, as one was not sure whether he was on the verge of a windfall or of a catastrophe. Then he stepped into the cab, and in half an hour we were back in the sitting room at Baker Street. Nothing had been said during our drive, but the high, thin breathing of our new companion, and the clasping and unclasping of his hands, spoke of the nervous tension within him. Here we are, said Holmes cheerily as we followed into the room. The fire looks very seasonable in this weather. You look cold, Mr. Ryder. Pray take the basket chair. What does Paramount Super before this little matter of ours? Now then, you want to know what became of those geese? Yes, sir. Or rather, I fancy, of that goose. There's one bird, I imagine, in which you were interested. White with a black bar across the tail. Rather quibble in motion. Oh, sir, he cried, can you tell me where it went to? It came here. Here? Yes, and a most remarkable bird it proved. I don't wonder why you should take an interest in it. It laid an egg after it was dead. The bonniest, brightest little blue egg that was ever seen. I have it here in my museum. A vis visitor staggered to his feet and clutched the mantelpiece with his right hand. Holmes unlocked his strong box and held up uh, the blue carbuncle, which stood out like a star with a cold, 
brilliant many-pointed radiance. Ryder stood groaning with a drawn face, uncertain whether to claim or to disown it. Game's up, Ryder, said Holmes quietly. Hold up, man, you'll be on the fire. Give an arm back into his chair, Watson. It's not blood enough to go in for felony with impunity. Give him a dash of brandy. So, now he looks a little more human. What a shrimp he is, to be sure. For a moment he had staggered and nearly fallen, but the brandy brought a tinge of color in his cheeks, and he sat staring with frightened eyes at his accuser. I have almost every link in my hands, and all the proofs as I could possibly need, so as little which you need tell me. Still, that little may as well be cleared up to make the case complete. You have heard, Ryder, of this blue stone of the Countess of Morcars? It was Catherine Cusack who told me of it, he said, he in a crackling voice. I see. The waiter ship's waiting maid. Well, the temptation of sudden wealth was so easily acquired was too much for you, as it has been for better men before you, but you were not very scrupulous in the means you used. Seems to me, Ryder, there's the making of a very pretty villain in you. You know this man Horner, the plumber, had been concerned in some matter before, and suspicion would rest the more readily upon him. What did you do then? You made some small job in my lady's room, you and your confederate Cusack. You managed that he should be the man stand for. Then when he left, you rifled the jewel case, raised the alarm, and had the unfortunate man arrested. You then... Ryder threw himself suddenly upon the rug and clutched my companion's knees. For God's sake, have mercy, he shrieked. Think of my mother, of my father. We'll break their hearts. Never went wrong before. Never will again, I swear. I swear in the Bible. Oh, don't bring me into court. For God's sake, don't. Get back into your chair, said Hearn sternly. It's very well to cringe and crawl now, but it's not little enough of this poor homeowner in the dock for a crime of which he knew nothing. How fine, Mr. Holmes. I live the country, sir. Then the charge against him will, will break down. Hmm. We'll talk about that. Now let's hear a true account of the next act. How came the stonies of the goose, and how came the goose into the open market? Tell the truth, for there lies your only hope of safety. Ryder passed his tongue over his parched lips. Tell you what just happened, sir, said he. When Horner had been arrested, it seemed to me it would be best for me to get away with the stone at once, for I didn't know what moment the police might not take it in their heads to search me in my room. There was no place about the hell at all where it would be safe. I went out, as if some, on some commission, I made for my sister's house. She had married a man named Oakshot, lived in Brixton Road, while she fattened fowls for the market. All the way there, an effort, the man I met seemed to be a policeman or a detective, and for all that it was a cold night, the sweat was pouring down my face before I came to the Brixton Road. My sister asked me what was the matter, why I was so pale. I told her I had been upset by the, by the jewel robbery at the hotel. Then I went into the backyard to smoke the pipe and wondered what it would be best to do. I had a friend once named Mosley who went to the bad, just been serving his time in Pentonville. One day he met me and told me to talk about the way of thieves and how he could get rid of what they stole. I knew it would be true to me, for I knew one or two things about him, so I made my right to go right on to Kilburn where I lived and take him in, 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 into my confidence. He would show me how to turn the stone into money, but how to get to him in safety. I saw the agonies I'd go through in coming to the hotel. Might at any moment be seized and searched, there would be the stone in my waistcoat pocket. I was leaning against the wall at the time and looking at the geese which were waddling about around my feet. Suddenly an idea came into my head which showed how I could beat the best detective that ever lived. My sister told me some weeks before I might have the pick of her geese for a Christmas present. I knew she was always as good as her word. I would take my goose now and in it and would carry my stone to Kilburn. There was a little shed in the yard and behind it I drove one of the birds. A fine big one, white with a barbed tail. I caught it, prying its bill open, and I thrust the stone down its throat as far as my finger could reach. The bird gave a gulp and I felt the stone pass along its goat and down to its crop. But the creature flapped and struggled, and out came my sister to know what was the matter. As I turned to her, the brute broke loose and fluttered among the others. Why, what are we doing with that bird, Jem? she said. Well, so you said you'd give me for Christmas, and the filling which was the fattest. Oh, we set yours aside for you. Jem's bird, we call it. It's a big white one over yonder. There's twenty-six of them. This makes one for you and one for us, and, and uh, t -t -t two dozen for the, for the market. Thank you, Maggie, says I. It's all the same to you, and Brad has the one I was handling just now. The other is a good three pound heavier, says he. We find them expressly for you. Never mind, I'll have the other and I'll take it now, said I. Oh, just as you like, she said, a little huffed. What which is it you want then? The white one with the barred tail, right in the middle of the flock. Oh, very well then. Kill it and take it with you. Well, I did what she said, Mr. Holmes, and I carried the bird all the way to Kilburn. Told my pal what he had done. 
for he was a man that was very easy to tell a thing like though. He laughed until he choked, and began a knife and opened the goose. My heart turned to water, for there was no sign of the stone. I knew some terrible mistake had occurred. I left the bird, hurried back to my sister's, and hurried down to the backyard. There was no, no, not a bird to be seen there. Who are, where are they all then, Maggie? I cried. Gone to the dealer's, Jim. Which dealer? Breckenridge of Covent Garden. But there was another with a barred tail, I asked. Same as the one I chose? Yes, Jim, there's two barrel tailed ones, and I can never tell them apart. Well, then, of course, I saw it all, and ran as hard as I could, my feet would carry me to this man Breckenridge. He had sold the lot at once, and not word would he tell me as to where they'd gone. Hearing yourselves tonight. Always, always, always answer me like that. My sister thinks I'm going mad. Sometimes I think I am myself. And now I am myself a branded thief, whatever, having touched the wealth for which I sold my character. God help me, God help me. He burst into convulsive sobbing with his face buried in his hands. There was a long silence, broken only by his heavy breathing and by the measured tapping of Sherlock Holmes' fingertips upon the edge of the table. Then my friend rose and threw open the door. Get out, said he. What, sir? Oh, heavens bless you. No more words. Get out. No more words were needed. There was a rush, a clatter upon the stairs, the bang of a door, and a crisp rattle of, of running footfalls from the street. After all, Watson, said Holmes, reaching for his clay pipe, I am not retained by the police to supply their deficiencies. If Horner were in danger, it would be another thing. But this fellow would not appear against him, and the case must collapse. I suppose I'm a, I am commuting a, a felony. It's possible I am saving a soul. This fellow will not go wrong again, for he is too terribly frightened. Send him to jail now, and you make him a jailbird for life. Besides, he is a season of forgiveness. Chance is put in the way of a most singular and whimsical problem. The solution of his own reward. Have the goodness to touch the bell, Doctor. We will begin another investigation, in which also a bird will be the chief feature. The End